स्थापकाय च धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णा ते नम जननी शारदा देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पाद पद्मे तयो श्रिवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुहु नम श्रीयतिराजा विवेकानंद सूर सज्जिदुखस्वूपा स्वामी नमस्कार एंड अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू हियर हु आर फिजिकली प्रेजेंट एंड ऑल दोज हु आर वर्चुअली प्रेजेंट Yeah, you may well laugh, but I'm sure that those who are virtually present are laughing when I say physically present. You know, so they are, they are, they are laughing at the people who are physically present. <laughs> What a beautiful selection of the song we started from: the light divine, the light within. Um, it it perfectly matches what we are going to talk about. In fact, I, we can not have the talk anymore because it. <laughs> that beautiful song said it all. <laughs> What I've decided to speak about today this morning is a question and the answer to that question. The question was raised by a Vedanta student. We don't know who he or she was, but it was definitely a very long time ago. The question we find in the Kena Upanishad at the beginning of the Kena Upanishad most conventional attempts at dating it have gone back to a time before the buddha definitely so that's at least 25 centuries or more than that so the question was asked oceans of time ago from across this distance and we will see what remarkable sense this question makes what a remarkable question this is what a remarkable person it must have been who asked this question for the first time and how after maybe 30 centuries we are finally beginning to ask this question again in the late 20th and early 21st centuries what was the question the sanskrit goes like this kene shitam preshitam patadi mana kena prana prathama preeti yukta kene shitam vacham imam vadanti chakshu shrotram kaudeva yunakti he asks the student asks the teacher who the teacher is and who the student is not mentioned in the upanishad but it's a dialogue the so student asks impelled by what light inspired by what power does my mind think impelled and inspired by what inner light are these words uttered what illumines my sight gives me the experience of seeing what is it that you know illumines my other senses by which i can hear i can smell i can so all of this this question he asks the question ko deva which bright being which light is it that impels that 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 inspires that illumines all this let us dwell for a while on the question what the question is is that all our conscious experience it's remarkable it's remarkable here is it here is this body of flesh and blood and bone and i can see i can hear i have the conscious experience of talking walking grasping something i have the conscious experience of thinking each of us has it in fact the most important thing that we all have ever is this conscious experience this is our life this is my life this is your life this is her life this conscious experience this continuous movie we are having all the time where we consciously experience the world outside sights smells people things where we experience our own thoughts feelings emotions so the an external world of which our body is also a part of the external world and an internal private world which we all feel all the time memories thoughts feelings desires frustrations fear all of that inside 
All of this is conscious experience. And this person is asking, what is the nature of this conscious experience? What makes it possible? What is the importance of this question? Let's think about it. This body is material. There's no doubt about it. It's a bunch of chemicals. If you ask modern science, they'll tell you there's so many chemicals, elements put together, and that's the body. Our flesh, our bones, our blood, and all. And after all, when you want to treat the body, come, you can come and join us here. But if you want to, if, you, if we have a problem with the body, the doctors give us medicines for the body. And what are those medicines? They matter. They're elements, they're chemicals. So that, that cures our, our problems, our physical, physical problems, because body is physical, it, it's matter. And the mind, and, and if you ask Vedanta, what is the body, if you ask Indian philosophy, they will answer the same thing, it is matter. They don't use our modern uh, terms for our modern elements, they will use the ancient terms which were used by all civilizations in the past. The five elements, our body is made of, they call it Panchabhuta, five elements. Earth, water, fire, air and space. Every ancient civilization, not just India, not all the philosophies, not just all the philosophies of India, but in ancient Greece too. Sometimes four elements, sometimes five elements. So they will say, yes, it is made of matter. The physical body is made of matter, the five elements. And the mind within, within which we experience, thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, memories. What is that? Modern science as yet has no clear answer. The generally accepted answer so far is that uh, mind is something which is produced by matter. It's uh, what they call, scientists call an epiphenomenon. You have a candle, you light a candle, it produces light and heat. It's a byproduct of a chemical process. So you have a lot of chemical processes going on in the body and chemical processes in the brain and nervous system. Somehow they say it generates what we the experience as the mind. How it generates, how it works, modern science has really, it has to be said, we really don't have a clue. Modern science doesn't have a clue. We're just beginning to investigate it. But uh, modern science is, it, it's a product of matter. We can't think of anything else. It must be a product of matter. But what it is exactly, we don't know. Vedanta has an answer. They say the mind also is matter. Modern science is right. But Vedanta has a concept of subtle matter. Our physical bodies, this table, our bodies, these are made of gross matter, the five gross elements. And these five gross elements have a subtle form, sukshma. Sukshma, that word means subtle. So these five elements have a gross, there's a gross earth and a gross water and a gross space and a gross air. And that is what co constitutes our subtle body. They call it the subtle body. And that is our mind, according to them. It's also material. In principle, it's interesting. Vedanta doesn't differ from modern science. Modern science, it says the mind must be generated by the brain. Vedanta says the mind is also material. It's also material. Now the question asked by the student, here is the brilliant insight the student has and the, the reason for asking this question. Matter is not consciousness. Matter is not aware. Matter is not sentient. How does matter suddenly become conscious, aware, sentient? It's like this bright lights which we have here. When they were in the shop, before the Swami bought them and put them in here, they were in the shop, they didn't produce light. When you put them in, it produces light. When you hook up these microphones to the electricity, it amplifies sound, it goes to you. When you hook up that camera, it starts recording video and transmitting to people, you know, through the internet. You, when you hook it up, it starts transmitting throughout the world and to other cities and to Canada and so on other places. What happened to the bulb, which was not giving light? What suddenly happened to it? It's giving light now. What happened to the microphone? It's amplifying sound. What happened to the laptop suddenly? It's transmitting data across the world. What got into these things? Let's put it in another way, even simpler. There is water here, and you drink it, it's sweet, strange. And then there is water here, you drink it, it's salty, oh, strange. It look alike. So you are, you are 
you can ask legitimately, what got into this water which looks clear, but it tastes sweet? What got into this water which looks exactly the same, but it tastes salty? So you know that somebody has put sugar in this water, somebody has put salt in this water. You know that this electricity has gotten into this bulb and it shines. Electricity has gotten into this uh, microphone and it amplifies sound. And electricity is flowing through these devices, the wonders of modern technology, our laptops and our cameras. Some one of them starts recording video, the other one starts transmitting data, hooks up to the internet. So something has come from outside which makes these things do what they are doing. They are doing what they are designed to do, but they need something from outside to make them do what they are doing because they don't do it by themselves. Now he's asking this question. What is it that gives us conscious experience? What is it which actually makes us what we are, sentient, conscious, aware beings? What generates this inner movie which we have, which we call our inner lives? What is that? That's the question he's asking. It's a powerful question. It's like, the difference is, um, nowadays we have, actually here in California, we have something called a driverless car. It's making the news. A Google car. And, and different companies are working on that. Now suppose you are driving along and you're coming here to, to the Vedanta class and you look at the traffic stop and you look and see, find this little car which is next to you and there's nobody at the wheel. <laughs> Nobody at the wheel. And you look at that. Now the Google car, car is driving along and it does perfectly well. It scares you, but the car is supremely confident. It drives along perfectly well. <laughs> it senses you, keeps a distance from you. It goes where it's supposed to go. I mean, it's incredible what they're doing now. If, uh, the, uh, I was reading uh, the covers. It was on the cover story of Time magazine just a month back. Not only are they saying they're going to make those things legal, they're going to make it mandatory. You will not be allowed to drive anymore. <laughs> yes. It sounds like something even in science fiction you couldn't have really <laughs> dreamt of it. But they say they're going to do it. They say that there is all sorts of reasons for doing it. Well, one of the transport authorities says, why would you want to put a human being in charge of a two-ton death machine? <laughs> which is your car. It's a, they are saying it's going to be much safer. And it's going to solve the parking problem. <laughs> Normally people wouldn't vote for such a thing, but if it says you're going to solve your parking problem, how does it solve your parking problem? It drops you off. Once you get down, it scoots off and it finds a place to park anywhere in the city. <laughs> when you want to go, you just summon and there's an app called Summon. You press the switch on that, it'll come to you. And it'll, it'll tell you I'm coming in 10 minutes. <laughs> it'll pick you up. And there's no driver in it. And it's already there, the te technology is there. Now the point here is why I'm asking, giving this is a beautiful example. And this example was actually used by a neuroscientist in giving a talk recently in Cambridge University. So I'm just quoting him. He says, imagine you are driving and the Google car pulls along next to you. Now, the Google car is doing exactly what you are doing. Driving the car, performing the same functions. But the Google car does not feel what it is to feel, uh, drive, you know. You have a conscious feeling. You see things, you are aware of other vehicles, you are, you are controlling, you have a feel of the vehicle you are driving. Sight, sounds, a first person experience, a subjective experience. None of it exists in the Google car. The Google car does not feel what it is like to drive. But it can drive. It can do exactly what you can do. In a fashion, after a fashion, it can also see. A sensor. You don't have to go as fancy as a Google car. When you put your hand in a wash basin, it starts giving water. It senses the presence of your hand. When you walk through a door in an airport, it opens. It senses your presence. So technically, those things are possible. But what is the difference? The difference is those sensors, that Google car, it doesn't have awareness, consciousness, a first-person experience. What do I mean by that? This is what uh, modern philosophers and neuroscientists, they are calling the hard problem of consciousness. Those who are in this field, they know about this. Consciousness studies is booming now in the last 20, 30 years. A lot of work is being done on that. 
And as we can see, it's the most important field of science because it's directly about ourselves. External world is out there, body is closer to us, the mind, the, the science of the mind, psychology is closer to us, but even closer to, to us is our own consciousness, awareness. So the science is finally beginning to ask questions about consciousness. And once they have started asking questions about consciousness, they have found the problem divides itself into two parts. One whole set they call the easy problem of consciousness. Easy within quotes because it's not at all easy, but still, comparatively easy. What are those problems? Um, the how do we see, how do we hear the mechanism? How is it that light enters our eyes and then it's converted into electrical signals going to the brain and, and so on? How is vision possible? How is speech possible? Those various processes which consciousness uh, operates in our body and mind. Those are technical problems and uh, what they normally do is, nowadays, there's a lot of work going on even in uh, San Diego here itself, advanced cutting edge work, what they do is they have sophisticated machines called fMRI, functional uh, MRI. They'll hook it up to your brain and when you do certain things, certain areas of our brains fire, neurons fire, and they correlate. You're looking at a cartoon and a certain area of the brain fires. So, okay, this is the neuron which fires when you watch Mickey Mouse. Something like that. Not, not as silly as that, but yes. So they call it a science of correlation. Something you do and something happens in the brain and they correlate. So this is one way of understanding consciousness. As you can see, it's a very physical way of understanding consciousness from an ex external point of view. But that's only one aspect. The real aspect of consciousness which is interesting is our inner experience. You know what the, what the difference is? It's like a doctor comes and examines the enzymes in my stomach and the secretion of juices and things like that. And finally, after all the examination says, okay, this person is hungry. And I can report to you that I am hungry because I can feel it. So I have an inner feeling, a consciousness. And externally, a scientist or a doctor may measure certain things and come to a conclusion, which I feel or you feel directly inside. So the direct feeling inside, how is that possible? How is that possible? That's not possible in matter. Because matter doing exactly what you are doing, the Google car and you driving, they're doing exactly the same thing. In one, there is a conscious feeling. In the other one, there's no conscious feeling. It's as a sophisticated computer a device which is doing all the things which we are doing. So the difference between the Google car and you. You can come here. You want to sit? You can come here. Copy. <laughs> okay. So this difference, there's a philosopher, David Chalmers. You can look it up. Um, a lot of the talks are available on internet and YouTube too. He has given TED talks and all it, and this is, subject has been going on for a quite a while. David Chalmers. He is the one who has posed the hard problem of consciousness. Look it up. It's very interesting. And it's so amazing to think that 30 centuries ago, here is this person in the Kano Upanishad asking exactly the same question. The Kano Upanishad. It's not easy to ask that question. We are barely beginning to understand this problem itself. We are barely beginning to formulate the question. A lot of very smart people don't even understand the question. I saw this debate on, online uh, between some very brilliant people. There was Rebecca Goldstein who wrote this book on 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and she's a scientist and a science writer. She wrote a, a biography of Kurt Gödel. And she was asking this question. That the fundamental question of consciousness is, uh, how do we get this first person subjective experience? And on the panel, there was this brilliant, absolutely brilliant guy, a mathematician, Minsky. And he did not get the question at all. He said, there's no um, problem of consciousness. There's a problem of 
how do we see and there's a problem of how do we hear and there's a problem of how do we speak and you uh, psychologists and science, you know consciousness studies people you are just because you don't understand them you are clubbing these problems together and calling it the problem of consciousness there is no problem of consciousness it's only a problem of seeing and hearing once we understand that the problem of consciousness is solved he just doesn't get the question what is the difference between the google car driving the computer driving the google car and you driving your car he says minsky says no difference there's just a machine doing the things and here is a physical biological machine doing something there's no difference but what about the inner experience there's no such thing as an inner experience you might think that's incredible but he doesn't get it is he a zombie or something it doesn't <laughs> has you be has he been made by google <laughs> But he's not alone. There are a number of very brilliant people who don't seem to think it's a problem at all. The light within, the light divine, the divine light which we, which we uh, just sang about. Minsky says there's no light. It's all dark inside. What light? So we are struggling with this question. We're trying to formulate this question now. And it's an accepted fact in consciousness studies. There are textbooks on it now. And people are struggling, but it's very difficult to understand, hard, very difficult to get a grasp on this question and let alone solve it. And what we are struggling to do today in the 21st century, 3,000 years ago, here's this person beautifully asking this question. Minsky would say, no, no, he's wrong. He's asking what makes my eyes see and what makes my ears hear. These are different questions. There is a separate process for the eyes and separate process for the ears, separate process for speech. But the person who is asking the question, look at the way he has put the question. 30 centuries ago, he answers Minsky. He says, no, it's one thing. He says, what is the one light shining through all of this? After all, it is our continuous inner experience right now. We know that though seeing something is a very different from hearing something and that is very different from smelling or tasting something and yet we all know these are all conscious experiences these are part of our conscious life it's one subjective experience which I'm having different types of subjective experience but it's me I am experiencing it these are not different processes the, uh, physically they are different processes, externally different, biologically they are different processes, but deep inside these are all conscious experiences which I am having. And the, that guy in the Kano Upanishad, he is asking this question, by what is this possible? It's not possible by itself. By itself a Google car is possible. By itself the water tap sen sensor is possible. But by itself a conscious experience of this human being doing all this is not possible. Something got into it. Something got into the water to make it salty. Something got into the water to make it sweet. Something got into the light to make it shine. It's capable of shining, but it needs something to shine. Otherwise, it would always be shining. Similarly, what got into this bundle of matter? Gross matter, the body, and subtle matter, the mind, which give, makes it lighten up, which makes it shine. What is that light? That is his question. Now we just begin to understand the question. And because the Upanishad in Sanskrit starts with Kena. Kena literally in Sanskrit means by what? So the Upanishad itself is called Kena Upanishad. So the by what Upanishad? That is the question. If you think the question is remarkable, and it is, the answer will just blow your mind. <laughs> to use an Americanism. The answer will just blow your mind. The teacher says that this is the most important question in all of human life. And its answer is the answer to all our questions. It's the solution to all our problems. It's the secret of spirituality and religion, the answer to this question. But the answer that the teacher gives is also very remarkable. It's puzzling at first. Let me give you the answer, then we'll go into it and see what it means for us in our spiritual life. The teacher says, and the student asks, so what is it that makes my eyes see, my ears hear, my speech speak? And the answer that the teacher gives is, Shrotrasya shrotram manaso mano yad vacho ha vacha sa upranasya prana 
चक्षुषश्चक्षुरतिमुच्यधीरा प्रेत्यास्मादलोकादमृता The answer has three parts. But the first part is a direct answer to the question. The question was, what is it that makes, makes my eyes see this conscious experience? What happens? What is that? What is that light? And the answer of the teacher is, it is the eye of the eye. It is the ear of the ear. It is the mind of the mind. It is the speech of the speech. What kind of answer is that? <laughs> the ear of the ear. Of any conscious activity you do, you, know, you speak. So it's the speech of the speech. You see, it's the, it's, the, it's the eye of the eye. You hear, it's the ear of the ear. By that, what does it mean? The teacher is using a very sophisticated technique and we'll try to break it down and understand what he's doing is, he's giving an answer, the perfect, most perfect possible answer to this very difficult question. We are just beginning to understand the question now. The answer will take some time to understand. But he's giving an answer, a very perfect answer. And not only a perfect answer, it's not a theoretical answer. He's putting it in terms which will be immediately useful to us. Let's see how. It's an answer which, if, if understood, leads immediately to enlightenment. It leads immediately to answer the question at the deepest level, who am I? Because by now we must have all understood what the student is asking is, what is this thing? What am I really? That's what a student is asking. This bundle of seeing, hearing, thinking, smelling, touching, being happy, being sad, desiring, and then finally growing old and dying. What is this thing? What's the mystery of this thing? That's what he's asking. Basically, he's asking, who am I? What am I? Now, the answer is this. The answer in one word is consciousness. But let's appreciate what consciousness is. Otherwise, you run the danger of going down the path that Minsky took. <laughs> consciousness is something that's produced by the body and mind. It's just a few processes put together. So, he says, first thing he says, you're, you're seeing, you're having the first person experience of seeing. What is behind that? What is the light behind that? He says, it is the eye of the eye. The moment you use a term like the eye of the eye, you immediately mean it is something different from the eye itself. First of all, you mean that. Otherwise, you, you would have said it is the eyes themselves. The moment you say eye of the eye, eye means E-Y-E, -E, the, the eye of the eye, the ear of the ear, you mean that there is something which is different from the eyes, something which is different from the ears. It's not part of the visual system. It's not part of the auditory system. No more than electricity is part of the bulb. No more than sugar is part of the water. It's something different from our physical body-mind system, number one. But yet it is not completely apart. It's something different, which is not part of the body-mind system, which means consciousness is not a part of the body. That's the first answer. Consciousness is not a part of the body. Hands are part of the body. My liver is part of the body or kidney is part of the body. I am not entitled to speak of my consciousness in that way. It's not like I have a kidney and I have two kidneys and a liver and a heart and a consciousness. Not like that. It is something apart from the body. That's number one. He also means by implication, it's not something produced by the body. The consciousness, the light within is not something produced by a mixture of chemicals in this body. Mixture of the matter can only produce more matter. It cannot produce sentience, awareness, consciousness. Remember, here I am making a subtle difference between so-called conscious activities and consciousness itself. Conscious activities can be imitated by matter. Your conscious activity of driving a car can be beautifully imitated by the Google car without consciousness. It is being imitated. But consciousness itself is not, is not produced by matter. That's what they're claiming at least. So it's not a part of the body. It's not even a product from the brain. Number one. Number two, by saying it is the eye of the eye, it seems to imply that in some sense it is the essence of seeing. 
it's not it's not just something apart and something different from the eye but it's there in the visual system itself so consciousness is something which pervades us it's apart from from the body but it pervades the mind and the body that's why we feel conscious the mind feels conscious at least hopefully sometimes vedanta classes have a make way of making the mind feel unconscious you know they go, they go, go off to sleep so it pervades the mind it pervades the body and when you say eye of the eye ear of the ear it is that which makes the eyes see that which enables the ears to hear that which enables us to have all these conscious experiences of seeing hearing talking smelling touching remembering doing all these conscious experiences are made possible by that light which is apart from this body and mind pervading this body and mind enlivening this body and mind just like electricity makes the bulb shine makes the fans go round and round makes the microphone amplify sound these activities are very different going round and round and producing air is is very different from shining and producing light is very different from magnifying sound is very different from transmitting data across the internet so different these activities and yet all of them are made possible by electricity as an example in the same way our activities of seeing and hearing and smelling and remembering they are all different activities but they are all made conscious illumined by consciousness so this is something different from the body mind system pervading the body mind system and enabling the different components of our body mind system to do what they are doing it makes the ear hear it makes the eye see it makes the organ of speech speak that's why the teacher says this all in that strange way of putting it ear of the ear student what you ask for is the ear of the ear eyes of the eyes the uh, the organ of the speech of the speech the mind of the mind it what he means it's one thing it's consciousness which enables all these different systems to start functioning and having conscious experiences that's one part why does he use this strange language why doesn't he just say consciousness what will happen if he say, says consciousness what problem will happen the problem which has happened in two ways first problem that will happen is i'm asking for an answer what is it that makes me conscious right and all that i'm aware of is the external world is my own body mind isn't it that's what we are aware of we are aware of objects they may be gross objects in the world outside they may be subtle objects in my mind thoughts and emotions feelings the moment you say what you are looking for oh student is consciousness what will i think i'll think it's one more object that there is something out there called consciousness now i have to find it you will never find it if you say that oh your question is a wonderful question and the answer to your question is you are pure consciousness we find it all the time in books vedanta books and everywhere it is said the answer is correct but it is not useful it's not useful yeah it, it's like that you know uh, there there's this person who was in a who was a balloonist a hot air balloon he went up and then he came down at some random place in a big field and he came down there and this man walked up to him he was still in the balloon is descending and he shouts down at the man can you help me i'm lost where am i can you tell me and the man looks up him at him and says mm, you're in a balloon <laughs> and the man in the balloon replies are you a mathematician <laughs> the man on the ground says yes how did you know well because of your answer it's absolutely correct and absolutely useless <laughs> <laughs> well this is at least useless but if you say that to the student you that that light which you are looking for which makes all this conscious experience possible which makes your conscious life possible that light is consciousness immediately that person the student will start looking for consciousness and he will never ever find it why not not because it's not there because he is the one who's looking he is the one who's looking whatever he finds will be not him 
He finds something that's, that's illumined by consciousness. It's like you're looking with a flashlight and you, whatever you find is not the flashlight. It's something which the flashlight illumines. And we try to say that that is the flashlight and try to turn it around. You still can't find it because it's still behind the light. So the consciousness, if you say it's just consciousness, the person makes a big mistake of looking for it. And it's not funny because we may think that's very funny. All, just about all the modern neuroscientists are right now making the exactly the same mistake. They're looking for consciousness. They'll never ever find it. They'll find the brain, they'll find neurons, they'll find neuronal activity, they'll find correlation between neuronal activity and certain reported states of the mind. Never ever find consciousness. In fact, there's one more step to go. In Indian philosophy, in Vedanta and Sankhya, beyond the body, beyond the brain, they have found subtle matter, which is the mind. So one day the scientists may even find subtle matter, but even that is not consciousness. That's just our mind, our thoughts, feelings, emotions. So it becomes an object which you start looking for. To prevent that, the teacher does not say to the student, hey, look, answer is simple. You are consciousness. That's it. Don't bother me. No. The teacher is now giving the answer to the student, the most precise answer that can be given, but also the most useful answer that can be given, which the student can use can catch hold of and get enlightened. He really feel, realize for himself or herself what he or she is. Mind of the mind, ear of the ear, eye of the eye. Knowing this, he says, Atimuchya dhira. The word used there, the Sanskrit word is dhira. Dhira literally means um, Literally, in, in our Indian languages, it means a patient person, a persevering person, um, uh, basically a spiritual aspirant, the one who is holding on to the spiritual pursuit, looking for God or self-realization till he or she gets it. So that's a dhira. What is he supposed to do? Ati mutya. The Sanskrit word is very interesting. What is the purpose of all this? What do, how do you use this? You use it in this way. The word I... Right now, every word refers to something. When I say pen, the word refers, pen refers to this, this, this object. So pen is a word and the object is this. Now let me ask you, here is a word, the shortest word, I, the vertical I. What does it refer to? What's the object? You say, I, look, I refers to this. When I say I, it refers to this. When you say I, it refers to that. So what is that? It's the body-mind. Here is my body, and which you can see, and here inside me is the mind which I only I have, I have got access to. And this is what I mean by I. When I say I, it means this. This is what is referred to by the passport. When it says Swami Sarva Priyananda, such and such person, this is the history, this is the background. It refers to the body and mind. And Swami Vivekananda says, sit quietly and say to yourself, I. If any thought of the body or the mind comes to comes to you, then you are not yet enlightened. <laughs> if the I refers to the body-mind, this is our condition, unenlightened condition. And what the I should refer to is pure consciousness. This is enlightened. This transferring of the reference of the I, the enlightened person, when he or she uses the word I, it refers to consciousness. Often an enlightened person will refer to the body and mind as this. Sri Ramakrishna is to do it. One day you will find that this is worshipped. Sri Ramakrishna is to say. When you come here, he is to say in, in Dakshinesh, in temple of Kali, temple of Dakshinesh. When you come here, when you come to this place, when you come to visit this, you should bring some gifts for this. That means fruits and like you bring for a holy person. So this, often he would, enlightened person will refer to body mind as this. Sometimes they refer to the body mind as I, as in Sri Ramakrishna used to say, um, my hand is broken or I will drink a glass of water. So he's referring to the body mind, but that they do only for purpose of transactions with us. In the Panchadashi, Vedantic texts, they say that the word I 
has three meanings. One, two, three. One meaning is used by us, most of us. Those who are, who are not yet lucky enough to be enlightened, we use the word I in the first sense. What is that sense? Body plus mind. That's how we use it, I, and no other sense. But the enlightened person uses the word I in two senses. One is consciousness, pure consciousness, the Atman, the light within. That which makes the eyes see and the ears hear and so on. Shrotras cha shrotram chakshushas chakshu. That one, the pure consciousness. By I they mean that. Or, and sometimes they use the I to refer to the body mind in a secondary sense. They know it's not right. But they do it just for talking with us. Otherwise we'll think they're crazy. <laughs> if they keep on referring to this. Now this is going to teach you. <laughs> so they, uh, the book says they use it in a secondary sense, in an in a, uh, um, artificial sense, they use that word I. Really for them, the I always means pure consciousness. And this one is secondary. Another thing which comes out of this discussion is, the body keeps changing. The body is in the name of a series of physical changes from childhood, from babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth to middle age to old age and disease and death. The body keeps changing. The mind keeps changing even faster. There are thoughts, thousands of thoughts every day. And the quality of the thoughts changes. Imagine the mind we had when we were um, 15 years old. So different from what we have it now. Imagine the mind, he'll be saying, I'm 15. <laughs> okay, you imagine the mind you had when you were five years old. So, so, so different. So the mind keeps changing. And yet, here's the crucial understanding. The consciousness which lights up the body-mind remains the same all throughout. Think about it. All the changes we experience are in the world outside, are in the body, are internally in the mind. Not in that which knows, illumines, lights up these changes. The consciousness is unchanging. What have we learned about that light, about that consciousness? It is something apart from the body. It's not produced by the body. It makes the body-mind do what the body-mind does. Eyes are seeing, ears are hearing and so on. And also, it is unchanging. The body-mind are changing. It is reasonable to assume then something which is apart from the body and mind, flooding the body and mind, when the body dies, that thing will still be there. That thing will still be there. But what will be the difference? That consciousness will still be there. The body may die. That consciousness, that light will still be there. But what will be the difference? The difference will be this. When the body and mind are there, you can appreciate the presence of that light. When the body is not there, the body dies, you cannot appreciate the presence of that light anymore. It's like, there's electricity here, when you plug a light into it, bulb into it, you immediately appreciate the presence of electricity, light. Take the bulb out, the electricity is still there. You can't appreciate the presence of that. Even more interesting, right now here for example, in this space, there is light, look. It's being reflected from my hand. You can see my hand shining in the light. If I remove the hand, it doesn't seem to be anything right here. But it's full of light, right here, see? I remove it, it seems to be nothing. It's full of light, but it seems to be nothing. In the same way, they say that consciousness, not produced by this body and mind, it exists all the time. Only it acts through the body and mind. It requires a body and mind to see, hear, think, smell, touch, remember feel. Without the body and mind, the consciousness does not do any of those things, but it's still there. In other words, you, the consciousness, you are independent of the body, the changes of the body. You are not born with the birth of the body. You do not get old with the aging of the body. You do not die with the death of the body. Consciousness is immortal. Mm. Ati Muchadhira, the moment you transfer the I from the body-mind and you actually, not just theoretically, it's difficult enough to understand theoretically, 
and actually to feel to, to make that transition that I am the witness of the body and mind the consciousness when you make that you are free of the travails the, the, the old age and the death and the changes of the body and mind you become immortal Pretyasmat lokad amrita bhavanti they say that Hira the spiritual seeker becomes immortal mortal man becomes immortal not becomes more precisely speaking always is immortal recognizes his or her immortality body will still die you cannot keep the body alive no matter how much gluten free bread you eat <laughs> you live better you live the body will be healthier to live better but still it will die one day but consciousness is not affected by gluten or by anything else <laughs> and it remains when the body goes when the body was not there the consciousness was there when the body goes when the body is there consciousness is there when the body goes also the same consciousness will be there according to Hindu Buddhist Jain or Sikh ideas there are many bodies we have a range of bodies which come and go life after life after life but the consciousness is independent of that moment the consciousness realizes itself independent of the body and mind the promise here is Amrita Bhavanti they become immortal they are no longer subject to body and mind they are no longer subject to birth and death and that is the goal of spiritual seeking to be independent to be to be above the suffering of body and mind what this tells you what the teacher is telling the student the light which you asked for that light is there in this very body and mind it's making all this possible you're seeing hearing smelling touching everything the core idea is that light that pure consciousness and realizing that you become immortal there is the greatest gain in all this it's not just a question in neuroscience it's the most fundamental question in all of human civilization we are beginning to ask it today Science is beginning to ask this question today. There are people even now who say that this question is meaningless. There is no such light. And others are saying that is the only thing that we experience. If you understand this question, you will agree that it's the most fundamental thing in all our lives. Imagine everything was there. The world was there. Body is there. But we are not aware of anything. <coughs> What would life be? There won't be any life. There won't be any personal subjective life for any of us. If there were only Google cars and no passengers and no drivers, there would be nobody to experience anything, let, let alone the Google cars. <laughs> so, most important thing is this consciousness, which the light within, what we sang, the light divine, which, which shines through us. Now, the, t the student is enthusiastic, like I'm sure all of us are, and he asks the question, yeah, I would like to know this. Great. The student is brilliant, so he has understood all this from the strange saying of the Guru. He said, I would like to know this light within. Tell me, how do I know this light within? And the Guru says, sorry, I can't tell you. I don't know. The next, next verse is very interesting. It says, Natatra chakshur gachati navag gachati no manaha navidmo navijani mo yatheta danushishyat I don't know how I can teach you to that. And I don't know it myself. Why? Natatra chakshur gachati. You cannot see this consciousness. You cannot see it, you cannot hear it, you cannot taste it. None of the sense organs can reveal this consciousness to you. Now vag gachati. Language does not suffice. You, that's why it's so difficult to express it with language. Because language is not meant to express the pure subject. Language always operates in the domain of the object. No manaha. You cannot think about it. Mind cannot know it, language cannot express it, sense organs you cannot see it, even the, with the most powerful instruments you cannot see it. And hence I do not know it, nor do I know how I can instruct you about it. The student says, hey, wait a minute, you're wasting my time then. You called us out on this Saturday morning, you could have done a lot of other things. <laughs> And after one hour you tell me you don't know, you don't know. Okay, I'm leaving. And then the teacher says, imagine, this happened 30 centuries ago. He says, wait, 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 wait. This is not all. And he says, there is a way of realizing it. 
let me try it. The, my teacher tried it upon me and I became enlightened, the teacher says. Let me try it upon you. Let's see if you become enlightened. The student sort of, you know, sort of sullen. Okay. Let's see. And the teacher says, Anya deva tadviditad atho aviditad adhi iti sushruma purvesham yena stadbya chasakshire. Our teachers started in this way. What's the way? It's like this. That which you are looking for, this consciousness, now you understand it theoretically. You want to know it practically, realize it. Yes, here it is there. Listen carefully. It is not something that is known. Oh, it's unknown. It is not something that is unknown. Anyad evatad viditad. It is something quite different from everything that you know. Okay, so it's something that I don't know. It's quite something that's quite different from everything that you don't know. What, what does he mean? He means something. I'll end with this. Um, let's see if you can tell me what he means. I've tried it with different audiences. Usually kids get it first. <laughs> it's like, just take it as a simple riddle. What is it that you do not know and yet it is not unknown? Tell me. There is something. Yes? Okay, that's another riddle. Yes, it's true. It's correct. But let me just um, you can give me a direct answer. Yes, you yourself. Think about it. You yourself. Do you know yourself? Anything that you say, I know myself. But look, at, just think about it. Wait a minute. Anything that you know about yourself is either your body, your personal experience, your biodata, your CV. Your own physical body, your memories, your ideas, thoughts, they are not you. We just saw. They are what you, the light, shines through. And yet, can you, so, so, can you say that I don't know myself? Of course not. What do you know more than yourself? Who else knows you if you do not know yourself? You know yourself all the time. It's just that we do not know ourselves objectively. As I know this pen or this microphone or this audience or even my own body or even my own mind, I do not know that which is knowing. And yet that which is knowing is ever shining. How is it shining? Well, it's just like all these people are here. How do you know that? You say, well, because I see them. You see them. The proof that they are here is because you see them, right? How do you know that you have got eyes? You can't say, I see them. You don't see your own eyes. <laughs> How do you know that you've got your eyes? Oh, I see my reflection of my eyes. No, that's just a reflection. The eyes directly do not see themselves. But how do you know you've got eyes? How are you so certain? Because you, by seeing me, you are sure that I am here. Now I'm asking you the question, by seeing what are you sure that you've got eyes? It's a trick question. <laughs> by seeing what are you sure that you've got eyes? By seeing, by seeing anything. The moment you see this, you know that not only is there a pen in Swami's hands, the eye, you also know that my eyes are open, that your eyes are open. Because you can see. The very fact of seeing reveals to you not only what you are seeing, but also the fact that you've got eyes. The very fact of seeing is a proof that you've got eyes. Otherwise you couldn't see. That's fair, fair enough. The very fact that you have a conscious experience, any conscious experience, is a proof, is a knowledge that you are consciousness. It is other than the known, other than the unknown. And it's the most precise way of pointing out what you are. It, they are not being vague. They are not being tricky. They are not being paradoxical. They are using language the best possible way they can to directly point to what we are in reality, in the very essence of our being. It's absolutely other than that which is known. It's not an object of knowledge. And yet it is not, not at all unknown. It's always known. You know yourself first, know within quotes, and then you know anything else. The song was there, that shining, everything else shines. The Katopanishad, which was they mentioned just before that song. 
तमेव भांतम अनुभाति सर्वम तस्य भाषा सर्वमिदम विभाति दैट शाइनिंग एवरीथिंग एल्स शाइन्स बाय इट्स लाइट एवरीथिंग इज लिट अप व्हाट्स दैट इट इट्स यू यू शाइनिंग एवरीथिंग एल्स शाइन्स व्हाट शाइन्स योर आईज शाइन योर इयर्स शाइन योर माइंड शाइन्स बाय योर लाइट इज द एंटायर psychophysical body you system you call yourself the entire thing is lit up by your light that is that what they are pointing towards it's always available all the time it's available what is its relation to god what is relation to spirituality that we will see in the question answer session we have got some more time to discuss it i just given you the core idea the subject was the light within just like the song the light divine it's that so in one word it's your true nature what you are in vedanta that is what is called god we'll, we'll see a little later that is exactly what is called god in in vedanta that light within you all right should we conclude now so we'll, we'll have a concluding song and then, and then we'll break and then come back for questions yes thank you very much thank you